Okay, so that was the case. The interesting thing about uh, these dreamers were that they were uh, a sickening chartreuse, that is a yellow green. And um, that means that there was chlorine in that streamer. And this would uh, be enough to upset uh, our ozone layer is to get some of that chlorine there. That's, that's an easy way to do it. Okay, so um, I realized as the aft end was being, uh, being uh, covered over with a cloud-like character that I, I best go and try to take a picture before I lost it. All the uh, all the picture of, over its whole length, and that I did, and I was successful in getting one picture. That it, while it's all clouded up from here to about <laughs> in here, still you can tell that uh, there is a body in there, and you're going to see that. It took me a long while while to figure that out, but because uh, it was so hard to, to get out of the uh, film that I had. Now, there is a, a quick pictorial of, uh, of this model uh, that I drew very soon after I got home, just to record uh, basically how it looked. It may not be exact proportion, but it does show the characteristics that, is, uh, that were there. And um, those streamers look a little bit more um, chartreuse-y. Now, this element here, I, I wanted to draw it to your attention because a streamer looked more like that in being pinch plasma, more sinusoidal and, and more harmonious to the eye. Um, now, that drawing there for the body, uh, it rests in there. If this is the nose, then uh, as you see it, the aft end is farther behind the picture than the front end. So uh, you can't quite see the nose completely as an ellipse, but uh, those kinds of uh, details are what tell you uh, how a body is, is viewed with respect to your eyesight. Okay. Now here is uh, my picture from our condo deck. Our, our deck was uh, like that deck, and I had my camera resting on, on a rail, like, like one of these rails. And I was shooting towards Santa Cruz, as you can see, and you can see that the, everything is all clouded up here. Um, you see a dark spot, which uh, indicates something's there, and uh, so on. Um, I don't know whether you can see the uh, a one here and a one down here, uh, but that's where the body is located. And then there's a, a projection from the body, which is labeled two. Now, this is a blow up, which uh, makes it more clear that there is a body right in here. It, it, this curve says that this thing is rounded. and. Uh, here is a cloud structure that's there, and um, it, the body's labeled one between these two ones, and then there's a projection here. Excuse me. Yes. When you face the screen, we can't hear you because you're not speaking into the mic. So okay. You lighten that mic. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there is a projection from the side here, and uh, that's labeled two. You can see some rising elements up here for three, and they're fairly substantial, and so you can get some indication of what's uh, making the clouding effect. Now, uh, there was in December, as I recall, uh, I made a sighting from my place at a high point uh, from Los Altos Hills. Um, and this had been going on for some time, and I finally got off my duff and um, photographed this object. It had shown itself as a, as a 
multicolored glimmering light. And I finally decided, hey, we've got to, we've got to get to know more about that thing. And at the top here uh, is a streamer. And right in here is the end. And here is uh, some cloud-like structure. And here is the other end in here. And you can see it has some color to it. Uh, and it's not just, uh, just white, uh, but all of that twinkles. And um, so when you look up in the sky, if you see something that's intensely bright and uh, it twinkles different colors and you see some streamers popping out, um, like I showed you, uh, that's not an airplane because it shoots out these streamers in all directions. And so you can be, you get more interest that way in what you're looking at and understand it. Now, uh, I want to know where this vehicle was geometrically. And okay, they've got the picture <coughs> tuned up here so that you can see that we did a sighting from Los Altos Hills, and I was down in Santa Cruz, and um, my wife was in Los Altos Hills, and she made a bearing fix on the, on the thing, and at agreed time, why well, I made my sighting uh, on the Santa Cruz beach, and what you see there is um, two lines that intersect, and they intersect about uh, 60 miles off of the coast, and uh, about 65 statute miles uh, away from uh, Point Sur, which is lower down. Now, I'm going to mention uh, the loss of the uh, Akron, or the Macon uh, Graf Zeppelin. And, and it is a Zeppelin. It's not a Graf Zeppelin, but it's, it's from the German design Zeppelin. Um, I knew Colonel Walter Gaspar who was the officer of the day at the time the Macon went down. And I remember his saying, well, it went down off of Point Sur. And I thought, well, gee, that's interesting. And so during the preparation for this talk, uh, I searched around and, um, and I found, lo and behold, the coordinates of where it went down. And as a matter of fact, having those coordinates, the uh, historical department of the Lakehurst Naval Station wrote me and asked me, what coordinates did you find out? Because they would like to record that. So uh, yeah, it was a little work to do that, but it was a lot of fun. Um, now, if that could be lightened up so people could see it better. But that is the, the Macon ship. And it went down uh, off of Point Sur. And its coordinates um, are just a degree away in terms of latitude and only a few minutes away in terms of, of um, let's see, one degree away in terms of longitude and just minutes away in terms of latitude. And uh, this thing carried 83 people, lots of gear. It's capable of carrying airplanes. It's a warship. And um, it went down in practically the location where um, we made our sighting. Um, now, the Orion airplane, the Orion airplane, um, went down in the same area. Uh, so here we have a couple of warships uh, that have gone down off of, uh, of Point Sur. And I think the characteristic, the fact that there were capabilities, this thing could carry four airplanes, um, it begins to tell us something about uh, what we can expect in terms of attitude from our extraterrestrial friends that obviously are out there. So, well, that's my own opinion. Maybe you won't disagree with me. I, I'm part of, of all of you trying to put pieces of a puzzle together, and uh, I don't mean to uh, try to belittle that in any way. It's, uh, it's another piece of the puzzle. OK, 
Okay, now we're going to move on to talking about Saturn. And uh, it's going to be brightened up. It's going the wrong way. Uh, the, the thing about this chart is that um, it shows that between the encounter that Voyager 1 had uh, on the date that's given there, 12 November, and then Voyager 2 came along, there's only nine months difference in the, um, in the time that these two missions uh, were conducted. <clears throat> now the party line, and I use party line as uh, what NASA says, you know, this is what we're going to tell the public. And they, they stick to a party line for a while, and then they, when they see that's not going to work, why they come up with another party line. Much the same as they do in politics. Um, the story was at the time that rings were made of primordial matter. The rings were essentially static and that there was no <coughs> material in the Cassini division. Well, when I took notes of Voyager 1 encounter live on TV, and I had about a stack fourth inch thick of, of notes, and then Voyager 2 came along, lo and behold, there was stuff in the Cassini division, and that was that was sort of a no-no. That was not expected. So, <clears throat> so now they've changed the the party line to say it's broken up moons and um, big ice chunks out there and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me. Now going on. I want to familiarize you with the, the names of the rings. Um, way out of the tip there, there, there is an A ring, or an F ring, and you move in, and that's a real tiny, insignificant ring. Then you move into the A ring, and um, then uh, the A ring has a division in it called the Enki division. So. And that Enki division moves like from 25% away from the outer edge to about 25% away from the inner edge. So that Enki division can move around. Now, um, going on towards the B ring, before you get to the B ring, you find the Cassini division. And there it's pictured with some material in it. Then there is the entire B ring, and right beside it, the C ring, and beside that, the D ring. Uh, by and large, we'll be dealing only with the A ring. Oh, there's the front cover of, of my book. The orange spot that you see there uh, will come up.